right. And then what I'm going to do is I want to talk about what the heck is IPM? <laughs> you just talk away. I figure this one, you just shoot questions and I'll answer. Yep. Yep. I figured you got it. So we're going to do that. Cause All I right. like this IPM stuff. Yeah, no, no. I want to get deep into this. All right, folks. I've got Janet Hurley who works for tech in Texas uh, with the extension service, she's going to explain what she does. And we're going to tackle the question of what the heck is IPM. Janet, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Franklin, for having me this morning. I'm so excited to be here. And yes, um, for, for those that are not familiar with who I am, my name is Janet Hurley and I'm with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. I'm an extension program specialist. And my um, program specialty area is helping schools with their IPM programs. Got it. So, so this is going to be because I've been having some in, intense conversations. Uh, and when I mean intense, yes, there was some shouting and <laughs> about what IPM is and what it isn't. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting challenged that what I am doing is not IPM. And because I do not follow the IPM pyramid uh, the way it is in some cases. And there's some people who work in other states where IPM uh, in public schools is law, uh, where in Florida it's not, it's, it's, it's guided, but it's not a law that is you know, hard in the yeah. books that you have to follow it a certain way. And I'm very familiar with Florida versus Texas. Texas, yes, we have a law. Okay. And yes, I mean, because we've got the longest standing law, as a matter of fact. So, yes, but IPM, people get hung up somewhat on the pyramid, but also just hung up on what is it? And a lot of it is a lot of folks focus too much on the pest management and don't understand the integrated part of it. Right. And, and so what, what I've been in here is the way I've looked at it. Um, I, when I, when from an urban, uh, residential perspective, when we get called in 99 out of a hundred, there is an active infestation. We can't start at exclusion. Correct. We have to start at chemical first yep. because there is an active infestation. And yes, we can implement the monitoring, which we do in case of German roaches. Yes, we're going to have to uh, then figure out how we educate the customer. But that usually the pyramid is usually turned on its head and it's chemical first. Then we work our way towards how many of these things can we actually implement with a client that is not a school that doesn't have a mandate and it's their home and we have to convince them to see it our way versus how many times are you going to spray a year for this? <laughs> and, 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 and what I've done is I've said, if I can get out of the six, or seven, I can get that customer to four. I've done IPM because I can't twist their arm and says, you have to do this. This is my home. I'll do whatever the heck I want. <laughs> well, and, and, and it is, I mean, so, and here is the rub. There is um, a population that believes that if it comes in a can and you spray it, it will kill all bugs dead. Yes. And therefore you're working with that premise before you even step on their property. Yes. Now, now granted, and what I am seeing now is especially there is a shift. You, you will have a client that will say, yes, you need to come here and annihilate everything. You are going to start seeing clients that are going to be a little bit different about what their, what their approach is and what they want. Right. All of it is still integrated pest management because the ultimate result, no matter who the client is, is educating them 
on how where that pest comes from, why it's there, and thus how do we get rid of it? You mentioned German roaches. Well, German roaches just don't walk in off the street. Exactly. Okay, that's a human to human contact, but I find that it's very hard for you for y'all in the business to be able to give messages to your clients that say hey by the way here is the insect and its biology and and everything else and then accept it right especially when we deal it in cases of multi-unit housing where we're not managing the entire building we get called in we got a lot of condominiums here uh some of these things are a million bucks $2 million yeah. and they've got German roaches because they don't, un the, the association doesn't understand that if a tenant moves in or bought a piece of furniture or something and it got introduced to the building, they're saying we can't have roaches because we have a pest control service, but they're only treating common areas. Owners own individual units and nobody's monitoring and inspecting and nobody's getting into this. And how do you explain a customer that has a $1 million condo? <laughs> well, this whole concept. And, and that's where, that's where the frustrating part is because there's someone like me in extension going, we know we need to get that education component out, mm -hmm. but I'm, I find myself even butting my own head here in the North Texas area. Mm -hmm. I have a grant with Dr. Faith Oy, which I'm sure you have extremely familiar with being in Florida. Yeah, we just and, had a lot of conversations in the last month and a half. And we have this project to where we're trying to educate those and we we use the term homeowner, but I don't mean a homeowner. I mean, the person who lives in a residence, yes. no matter where you're at, mm -hmm. from even if you were living in a tent to living in that million dollar condo and everything else in between. Right. You know, if it's a structure and you, you were trying to live there, you don't want pests. Right. I don't want pests. Right. I mean, full disclosure, you know, I, I, I have a company that does my house. Part of it is because I get to train them and I can tell them to go crawl up and seal that hole right. where the rats might get in. But yeah, it's, it's a hard thing, this IPM stuff. Right. And, and, and I think the, a, a big com, the biggest pushback I'm getting from the industry, not from the client, because we have a, a, a unique business. We have a unique selling property. Our customers don't want the chemical, my customers in particular. They are very receptive to what we try to do because we've branded ourselves as an eco-friendly company because we can't sell IPM mm -hmm. as, as a marketable. There thing. is nothing. I mean, in my 20 years, I can tell you in doing what I do with a, this international IPM symposium group and try, there is nothing sexy, marketable, or anything that says IPM. Finally, somebody says it. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it. it's mind blowing. But I mean, Bobby Corrigan and I will both tell you, you put your head down, put your butt in the air, go search that pest out. You put your little detective hat on and you go out and solve that problem. That's IPM. Call it whatever you want. Yeah. And there's there's the purists that say, well, no, I did IPM in schools uh, and and what you're doing is not IPM. Because you first, I mean, I, I, you first have to okay. use the sticky traps and then, I mean, if you got a, a, in your, in your state, which you have Tawny crazy at, yep. Uh, if it's still called Tawny crazy, cause that yes, thing has had more Tawny crazy ants. And okay. Yes, cause this had changed shapes with Tawny crazy ants. You bet your bottom dollar. I know what we're going to, what they're going to do. And it is a chemical application. Yeah. I have told more than one school district. Sometimes you've got to throw the bat first and then come back. Right. Yeah. Cause how are you going to, how are you going to use IPM or you, with, with glue traps and say, well, I've got to fail three times before we can apply a chemical. No, there is 
glue traps are monitoring and they're passive. So for instance, because Texas has had this school IPM rule since 1993, mm -hmm. that, okay, you put into fact, the school districts have got to monitor. All right, well, yeah, most of the time we don't have a problem. Then we had COVID. Right. And I had a few districts that when they shut down last year at this time and didn't get back in until about June, well, they had some very odd issues. Well, the odd issues wasn't throwing a, a glue board at it. The odd issue was they had roaches and bed bugs in laptops. Well, what are you going to do with that? Well, there's a few options, and those options do require some heavy chemical locked up and nobody does anything. But if you do that over the weekend, problem solved, because I got news for you. 500 devices with little bugs crawling out, IT's not going to be happy. So, I mean, what's worse, the poison or the cure? Right. Because sometimes you've got to look at the problem and go, okay, what other steps? Monitoring with glue boards, with um, trapping. I mean, you go, you go, you know, insect light traps. I'm thinking yellow jacket traps. There's a uh, fly. There's, um, you know, pantry pest stuff. Monitoring is a big scope of things. Right. And that's part of it. But again, the other part is what's where's the pest proofing and the pest prevention? Because I'm sure with your clients, even in Florida, because it's like here in Texas, as long as the bugs are not in my house, I'm kind of all right with everything. Yep. Bugs out in nature. And I had to laugh because I was working in the yard over the weekend. And sure enough, I moved something and stirred up a nest of odorous house ants. But only I would look at that as I'm doing it going, oh, hey. Right. <laughs> yeah, but it's not I in my house, do... so no big deal. I can deal with that. I mean, well, I, I actually, I was like, okay, you're not at the house. You're outside. You're in nature. Knock yourself out. I'm not going to bother you. There's no need for it because I know they're not going to come in my house. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm having that that discussion because we, we are, we focus on the exterior of that home where all, the, and especially in Florida, where all the bugs are outside. Once you got a humidity problem solved, silverfish gets pretty much solved. Most of it is going to be ants. We deal with so many ants down here. And we have to perform a barrier treatment on a time basis or that customer is going to call complain. And we can say, well, we really can't make a chemical application unless you actually complain in order to comply with IPM. There is no customer on the planet, for the most part, that's really going to accept that. So that's where <laughs> you I told just, you it was going to be a hoot. <laughs> you just hit the the one thing that really just gets on my one last nerve about the IPM stuff, right? Because it's that definition. So, and I. I take ownership of this one. Okay. Because when we were moving our, a little history about the Texas pest control rules. Okay. We have this huge department of ag like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was all enacted, you know, early in the 1900s. In the 70s, when there was this big push for structural pest control across the nation, our agencies split. We ended up with the Structural Pest Control Board and the Department of Ag. Well, the board is the one that got the school IPM law passed and adopted and managed up until about 2007. And then when they were abolished and put on back under the Department of Ag, we had to clean up our school IPM rules. Well, one of the things that I, I kind of pushed for was defining IPM. So this is the definition that we use in our rules. Okay. All structural applicators. Integrated pest management, a pest management strategy that relies on multiple pest control tactics 
including the ju judicious use of pesticides, informed by accurate identification and scientific knowledge of pests, reliable monitoring methods to assess pest presence, preventive measures to avoid pest infestations, and thresholds to determine when corrective control measures are needed. That's a lot of words, but that's a right. that's it in a nutshell. Right. Because the including the judicious use of pesticides, if you go look up the term judicious, give thought. <laughs> I'm going to give thought about what it is, but my informed, accurate identification and science scientific knowledge of pests. So here's the conundrum. Every extension specialist in the country, any entomologist. I got some ants and they're black. Really now? Right. <laughs> little black ants. Well, yes, there is a little black ant, but are those pavement ants? Are they something else? Because an entomologist will tell you, even myself, who's an associate certified entomologist, well, we have close to 250 species of nuisance ants in the United States. Not knowing genus and species or at least its common name makes it very difficult for the pest management professional to understand to make that judicious use of pesticides without understanding accurate identification and scientific knowledge of pests now for you who've been in florida for a few years you know what your most common ants are right and you know what products you're going to use now you can switch them up. I always tell everybody, you know, the other thing that we don't do, well, and it's hard, and you probably got one of the best ones sitting right in your own backyard by the name of Faith Oy, who really goes on about changing up your chemical composition yep. because that's part of it. But that reliable monitoring methods to assess pest presence, yeah, you use your customer, yeah. I'm yeah, what monitor out. what monitor do you use to monitor a ghost ant pest pressure level in the area? It can't well, be Well, that's what I, I was thinking. I'm like, I'm not thinking, well, glue boards and ants never go together. But you got to know your area and you've got to yep. know what's conducive conditions. Right. So again, understanding that, I mean, there is, IPM is so much more than that pyramid. Right. It, it really is. And it's that multiple control tactics. And yes, I may even have a little perimeter spray around my house. I mean, I don't want fire ants coming in. I don't want the odorous house ants coming in. Yep. I mean, we know that we you've got odorous and we have ghost ant. You've got and uh, this is you got the, the tapanoma. Uh, Cecil and I've got tapenoma melocephalum. Um, if I do not make and and one and we've it forced me. This little ant brought me to my knees, made me cry, and basically forced me to have to use fipronil, which I never had to use before. Never had to. In 14 years of pest control, we started using it two and a half years, three years ago, because 50% of all our ant calls were this little ant that nobody could get rid of. And we had to go in and use Fipronil on every initial to get, because if we used um, neonicotinoids, we found ourselves making two applications versus Yeah, one. and then you run into a whole nother thing when you're using the neonics nowadays, so yeah. yeah. So now we had to make two chemic, add more pounds of active ingredient yep. versus a one shot where we knocked it down probably 96% on one shot because we used the Fipronil versus having to make two applications of a neonic, which adds more chemical than necessary. And so we found ourselves in that predicament saying, here we are an eco-friendly company. We're trying not to use these products, but we have no choice. And now we figured out that if we get it knocked down, we don't have to use it as often we don't even have to do a quarterly. We only reapply it if our other lower end products haven't gotten the control. But I have to make a timed application of something because as a commercial business, 
I can't afford a 30% callback rate, 40%. Well, and nobody can. I nobody mean, can. And, and we do that again, you know, like I said, down in the, the, the Houston Gulf Coast area. I mean, because if you're not in our state, you're battling an ant. We just don't know which species you've got because yeah. one of them can be, but even with fire ants, depending on, you know, where you're at and stuff, I tell my schools, if it's going to be an area that's going to be heavily used and you don't, you can't go out and do the IGR th three, four times a year, well, then you might need to use the, the bagged Fipronel yep. top choice. Yep. And put that out because again, it, yeah. Practice, so one of our things that we have to say when we do our school IPM stuff is talk about practical and economical. And I tell them all the time, I'm like, well, we've really got to work that out. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm also home to the state of, and ironically, I was leaving your home state from a meeting with faith <laughs> on my way back home we had done a work group meeting and got a call from a school district where a child had died because they had been exposed to fire ants. Yeah. And it was one of those deals where <clears throat> part of it was on the, the coaches who didn't, did not understand what anaphylactic shock is. Right. Didn't get medical help. But at the si same time, it exposed a weakness on how the district was actually putting out their fire ant bait. Rather than doing the 40 acres that was the joint property between two campuses, they were only doing two acres surrounding the campus and the athletic field. So, and my comment to everybody was, well, yeah, you treated that, but did you think the fire ants that were out in between those 36 acres that they knew someplace different. Right. No, you know, thy beast, know thy pest. Right. So the one thing I tell everybody that you were saying, you know, you're worried about the chemistry, you got your labels, you got your safety data sheets, you know how you're applying it. Right. But you also put on your service ticket, genus and species. Right. You put down that specific because if somebody was going to go, and judge you if they go up and look up stuff because there's enough out there with credible information on these insect pests right. that we're having to throw things at them because they're not native right they don't have a predator here so they can out compete and they can't and their life cycle is so quick they can also become resistant yeah. yeah. Who knew being and and pest management that you were going to be a detective? Yeah. No. I mean, when when I listened to to Bobby Corrigan about you know biological mm -hmm. uh, 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 assessment and 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 evaluation, I mean the terms are. I, I noticed the terms are changing, and the conversation around, and, and I think we need to have the the healthy conversation about this because there are those who are defending IPM that it can't be changed. And this is the problem that a lot of people are having with IPM because it is so rigid in certain areas where now we're going to assessment based management with Deanie Miller's talking about that. And, and that is awesome. It's still not marketable from us, from a pest control yeah. perspective, but we're all supposed to be doing assessment based pest management, <laughs> all of us. Uh, and that? all of us are supposed to be doing what Bobby says, you know, to looking at the uh, being an observational biologist and and these terms. But when you start throwing the term in IPM, then everybody loses it. And, well, and, 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 that's, and that's where that's where everybody's getting hung up on. That's where I'm the rabble rouser, like in the room. Right. It's again, I look at my definition going reliable monitor monitoring methods to assess pest presence. Okay, I'm pretty sure I just threw everything you just said by everybody else in one little sentence, you know, bullet point. Right. But again, if you know thy pest, rats, roaches, um, bats, because I get those calls, um, I'm sure you do too, uh, 
you know, raccoons, ants, spiders, every last one of them's got some type of scientific knowledge and you've got to assess in that rig rig rigidity mm -hmm. that I know what you're talking about drives me crazy. Right. And because this is a PG rated show, <laughs> we're going to just say drives me crazy. Right. Because in my 20 years, and you mentioned my, my, my buddy, Bobby, when I learned IPM and I learned it from him and Dr. Mike Merchant and, and my other coworker, Dr. Don Renchi, but it was what we referred to as this head down button air thing. I'll never forget, we were at the Indian Reservation and you could smell the, the pine cleaner. I swear to God, we had to bend 500 feet away from the door. And Bobby was so, so cute. He tapped me on the shoulder and he goes, just because it smelled clean doesn't mean it is clean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I talk about pest control clean and, and, and real clean and, and people don't get it. And then yeah. I proceeded to watch him crawl on floors, turn the place. The place was actually pretty darn clean until we got into the student dormitory. And this was 2002. And I saw bed bugs for the first time. Wow. But we were, we were at, and it was sunny and it was arid and they had those plastic mattresses. He just, him and Dr. Mark Lame had us haul all these mattresses out and toss it on the ground. And that was part of the IPM solution. Right. And then talking to the folks about what they really needed to do and what was pest control back then. And the only thing none of us, I don't think really grabbed onto was, well, those were bed bugs. And oh, if I had had a crystal ball back then, I should right. have saw that one coming. Right. Yeah. And this is where we get, and there's the conversation that we're having with the IPM purists, um, where they refuse to call what they do IPM. They're calling it something else because they say, well, you, it, it isn't IPM because of the legal definition of IPM. The legal definition of IPM has to be changed in order for us to call it IPM. Baloney. <laughs> okay, so there is no legal definition. EPA and FIFRA does not have a legal definition. Good. I'm glad, therefore, I'm glad somebody cleared that up. <laughs> therefore, everything that everybody spouts is multiples of definitions. Now, the definition I read to you that is the Texas Department of Ag's definition for structural right. pest control. Right. Yes, we did that because it helped clarify what when our inspectors go in to do the school IPM inspection because they were required by law to do that. Right. Then they have a basis along with our law that says and it is, it is its own code in the Department of Ag's um, structural rules that says that, you know, they're going to have a coordinator, that they're going to monitor, that they're going to educate, that they're going to use preferential use for least toxic chemicals. Well, our least toxic is green, yellow, red. And truthfully, the genesis behind all of that, especially when you think about the law was passed in 1991, when I had long hair and, you know, wore contacts, had a whole different life back in the early 90s. But I think back to what they were doing and what they were doing when they passed that bill was to change the behavior of pest management professionals. Because back then they were pesticide, they were exterminators and they were going in and spraying baseboards. Right. I mean, what precipitated us getting the rule was people going out and taking care of head lice with ag chemicals inside buildings. Well, if, if you cannot stop people from doing something against the rules, then I guess you got to write better rules to circumvent that. 
Right. But is there a federal definition of IPM? No. Now, on the USDA side of the house, under um, the National Institutes for Food and Agriculture, that area has a definition for the IPM roadmap. Most of that roadmap goes to agricultural, but yes, urban community dabbles into it because what really want to drive me bonkers is the fact that I've got so many different regulatory agencies that all say, yes, we love IPM, but no two of them can come together and really help unify this right because you and i both know i mean i grew up with that kid yeah they sprayed the baseboards but i still couldn't figure out what for but if i got cockroaches and when i was a kid growing up we moved from apartment to apartment well i got news for you you know what my mom and i did when we were when i was young you take over a new apartment i went down to the store and guess what i bought came in a can you Pop the lid, close the doors, walked out, let it go, it. come back in, open the windows, air it. But guess what? You didn't have anybody else's bugs. And then I got older and got very interested in IPM because I volunteered for something and then stumbled into this job just because I volunteered at a, a yard expo on IPM but once I figured out what IPM was was no pest no pesticide that's the main premise right but you and I both know outdoors there's a strong probability there's some type of pest right it's just not in my indoors right as long as you're not coming in and spraying my baseboards hey thumbs up that's been my premise from from because see I come from LNO and yeah. to me, it was unconscionable in, 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 my, in my genesis of being in pest control to mix that many products to kill something for the simple purposes of making something pretty that somebody had planted. I mean, to me, it made me, it drove me bonkers from a conscious perspective. We're spraying this entire yard with two insecticides, two fungicides, herbicides, and all these kids are crawling all over this for no other reason than to say, I've got a pretty lawn. It, it, and, I, and I get it, and I don't believe in the legislation of that, but I said I have to find a better way, and that better way for me was IPM when I started talking to the uh, extension agents and educating me on cultural practice. Yep. And then I went to agriculture and I said, well, who are the guys that can't afford to get it wrong? It's the ag guys. Let me see what they're doing in organic agriculture. And let me learn from that. And I started when I founded my company to say, why don't we just implement that? It says, if you mow it high, you mow it frequent, you control the water with the point where we're using half we were using 66 percent less chemical yep than the average and then when 25 bees came in we were able to integrate that because we could never really be successful with biologicals in in a commercial landscape it just wasn't feasible it wasn't practical for us so we figured it out that hey people are like how much chemical uses well we only using this one pound a season for fungicide and they're using five of those bottles a year where we were using one so we got into radical pesticide reduction and I showed people how to use, I mean, like having a power rig to spray shrubs to me was useless when you were spraying bifenthrin and 95% of the bifenthrin was landing on the ground, totally missing the shrub. Yeah. And so we started learning from agriculture how to make applications to those shrubs where we used, instead of 90 gallons of water, we were using nine and using 90% less water and getting the application actually on the shrub, not in the ground and not in the air. And see, th that brings up all the other things. And, and truthfully, I mean, that's kind of not quite that story as far as how I got into IPM, but it was, I had was in a, a home, had a coworker who loved to compost 
but I didn't think that was enough. And here we have this soil called black lamb prairie, which is just, it's just mm. like clay. Couldn't figure out what was going on with my yard. That's when I started learning about this IPM and learning about aeration, but it's all, it doesn't matter if it's an indoor problem or an outdoor problem. It's solving what's, what's at the root of it. So again, what you really are focusing on outdoors in your land, landscape, it, landscape is, do they got good soil? What kind of moisture do they have? What kind of plants do they have? Right. Is there anything that we need to be aware of? Because again, Floridians are no different than Texans in that, yes, there's places we have high humidity, but there's also high wind. Right. You know, it, it, you guys have got to worry about salt and sea spray. I mean, yeah. there are different things and it's, well, just because that looks really good on TV, it may not look so good in your yard. Right. I'll the see right, stuff. The right plan know. in the right place is something I battle with landscapers where they put that plant where the customer wanted. And I said, I don't care how much fertilizer I throw at this. It's never going to look good. Nope. Because you ain't you don't have the light. It needs light. It doesn't need fertilizer. No. And, it, and that's the biggest problem I have with education is that we got to educate the landscaper and we got to educate the homeowner, but the industry doesn't want to get out and educate the homeowner, the industry, because then we have to give away secrets and then we have to do so many things and we don't want to get into that business, but nobody wants to educate the consumer. And I well, believe and that that's where my responsibility lies is to educate the consumer. And that's where, you know, Dr. Oy and I have both been, you know, back and forth on this because that's where I would love to get our master volunteers more active and getting them to do outreach. That's where that, that comes from. As a matter of fact, I'm hoping to launch a program later this year that where we do start, I've got um, what we call these IPM experience houses here, mm -hmm. where we could do educational programming and show homeowners, hey, these are some of the things you just need to be aware of because especially here in North Texas, I've got people who are buying homes for the first time and they're not understanding what to do, how to do it, what to plant. And I mean, yeah, I've learned. And I tell everybody, yeah, I'll put in the back work, which I did Sunday. But I also plant plants that are going to sustain themselves for the rest of the summer with little to no maintenance. Right. You know, because I don't have time. And once COVID really kicks loose, I'll be back on the road and I won't know if I've come or gone or already been there. Yeah. No, I I, I, I I love natives. It's just that in Florida, they're so plain. It's so hard. Yeah. There's, there's no colors. So I, I battle with that, but I can show the client options with really low maintenance plants that don't require any pesticide. That don't require, like for, we have Schifflera, you know, very rarely yeah. is it going to get anything at all. There's no, why you if the customer feels like if you didn't spray their plants, you didn't do your job because you were supposed to spray all of them. I said, but why are we spraying those plants and applying a pesticide when it gets nothing? And that's where my education is with my clients, where I sit down and I consult all of my clients is that we're going to do this, this, this is why you hired us to not have the chemical on your property versus having to make a blanket tank mix application running around town with, 200 gallons of a pre-mix because it's just much easier to spray everybody like this than to actually do work that requires a technician to think. And yeah. And it's just, it's reminding the clients, you can always say, you know, we're doing this, that we also protect, you know, the bees, the butterflies, yeah. the, the hummingbirds. Yeah. Sometimes you got to go throw back something else at them. I tell everybody, sometimes you got to just throw different words back at them that they go, Oh, you, Oh, right. you're protecting the bees. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so, and this is where we have gone through that. We, we got to give the client what the client wants in their mind. In other words, my clients are looking for natural and organic. And people will say, well, you're just misleading the client because there's no organic. I says, well, we have five options that we can give the client. It might not be in their price range. It might not be what they want really but we have the options. And then if you can mow that lawn weekly versus every two weeks, 
it's going to need much less fertilizer. We've got blackout areas in, in the state of Florida, as you know, where you can't use nitrogen throughout the year. One of the things that I discovered is as I was doing the services the way I was doing for the landscapes, I could not sell the client on residential pest control service because they didn't have any bugs in the house ever. We were automatically spraying the lawn around the property. We found that, hey, it, it didn't dawn on me until like five years later after doing this. Why can't I sell them pest control? They wouldn't buy any because he says, when you started doing our lawn, we don't have any more ants in the house. We discovered by serendipity that we didn't have to apply pesticide. I wasn't smart enough to know this then that if I did not apply a pesticide indoor, they had no bugs where people say, no, you have to go inside every single time and apply something because the customer expected our customers were saying, we don't need you to spray the inside of the house. So we said, why don't we just create a service that doesn't require the indoor spraying all the time? Yeah. Do an exterior only people are in the industry threw up their arms and says, no, because that's not pest control. I says, and, and so this is where we're having this debate all the time where, so if I, if I don't spray the inside of the house and they have no bugs, I'm not doing pest control. Let me get that straight. So, and, and that was, that was <laughs> yeah, the whole. That's the, that's the mind blower. Cause I'm like, but, but, but you are, if I'm happy, you know, and everything's being done. And if by chance I do notice something, carpenter ants, you know, right okay, y'all are willing to, hey, maybe I do need to step inside right, and take a look. But if I can put the bait outdoors, great. If not, but I mean, that is pest control. I'm sorry because- Yeah, if, if the bug isn't there, it's under control. And, and then this is where people are like having a fit all the time where we're providing, let's say we, we're, we're really fanatical about baits. I mean, we're indoor, we, and it's in our website and it's our policy. A, a technician cannot spray the inside of the home ever. We have a zero spray policy in Florida. People say you can't control bugs without spray. I said, we've been doing it for nine years inside where we use predominantly baits. Mm -hmm. And if we can get away with borate baits, gel baits, borate baits, we get we get it done and we control I was gonna ants. Say, there are two there are two well known urban entomologists out of Virginia Tech and Rutgers, Dr. Miller and Dr. Tulu Wang, that prove that. Yeah. And this is we used we used her protocols. And before I knew her protocols, I was using uh Brenner's material that he did uh for yeah. controlling roaches. And we develop an entire protocol where we applied it into the inner city HUD. Inner city HUD said they've never been able to control the German roach population in, in this part of the inner city. And it took us three years. And we got it done with nothing more than bait. And it can An entire be community. And like I said, I have saw the research that both of them presented yeah. years ago, but it, it, I've seen it myself. I'm like, the, the biggest problem people get stuck in a rut, and I don't care what kind of pest control you're doing, is I go and I use the same chemical over and over and over again. Explain, so expecting a that? different result. Yeah. <laughs> the definition, definition of, of insanity. insanity. Yeah. And, and, and here's where the biggest, uh, what I've done where, and, and, and Faith was teaching this, she teaches this a lot, is chemical rotation. The problem yep. is pe people keep rotating their chemicals with the same active. Yes. I mean, with, with, with the same group, not understanding that you need to change the entire group, not just the active ingredient. That's not chemical rotation. Um, and so we're, we're having all these discussions and I'm trying to have these discussions openly and honestly about the real expectation. One of the biggest challenges that I'll, I'll, I'll have this probably, she, you can probably speak to this, but I think Dini Miller we probably have a, a, a stronger opinion is when I challenged HUD on the fact that is it the pest control company's fault in public housing, in this case, government, is it the pest control company's fault that they bid it low or the fact that you knew it couldn't be done and you accepted that bid anyway, when you know you can't treat for a dollar a unit and say, HUD is telling us, yeah, but we don't have the funds and we don't have the money but all the data is there that you paid for 
to show that this is how you do inner city roach management, not by hiring a pest control company that does a spray service, yet you still believe that they could do it for $1.50 a unit when it costs $9 a tube to control German roaches. Is it HUD's fault? And then we're throwing it on the pest control industry saying, well, they're not performing the inspections. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. Says, but you know, it can't be done with what you're paying. So whose fault is it really that we have this issue? <laughs> because this is where the rubber meets the road. And this yeah. is something that I've really started to. <clears throat> this is where I question again, those agencies that say we, we, we support IPM, we believe in all this. Right. But do you think this all happens by magic? Right. I mean, a lot of that in order for, and really to be real honest with you, no, it isn't successful with a company. Now, could that building hire somebody and that's their full-time job, that and fix door sweeps. Right. Because that would be three-fourths of it. Right. You know, but are they still willing to do that? Because you know darn good and well that person, even if they hired them to do that, wouldn't get be able to do all that because something have... else would come up. Oh yeah, no, yeah. you need to come over and fix this electrical socket. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever. And then the pest control gets pushed to the side. Yeah. This no, is, and not not only that, but does are they willing to put that person through pest control training so they understand that this is how you inspect a unit, this is how you seal, this is how you do it, and then they'll say, well, we don't have the budget still because this is additional work. And yeah. and I deal with this in private with with buildings that call me in that are private that said we want to go eco friendly, and then I start talking to them about the reality of the cost and how we have to do these things. I had one building do it and they were complaining about American roaches on the first floor, seven story building. And I said, well, what is the guy doing? Well, he's spraying the inside of the common areas every time. I said, but look at these doors. I can stick my entire hand under these doors. All of a the sudden they invested the manager, the, the technician, um, the guy who does the maintenance, the maintenance engineer said, install these sweeps on all your doors and watch how this problem goes away and you don't have to spray it anymore. And they did that. And now nobody complains about American roaches on the first floor anymore. Uh, it's amazing how that happens. And, and, and then this is where I, get, you know, again, where the rubber meets the road, their initial investment to convert to an eco-friendly building where all we did is take lead practices mm -hmm. and said, this is what you need to do was a, Ten to twelve thousand dollar investment initially, but they were overrun with German roaches in the laundry rooms, in the trash rooms, and in certain corridors because the guy wasn't doing any monitoring. So he was spraying everywhere, yet we didn't know where the problems were. It took us six months to fix all this at, at ten grand when they were paying they were paying two hundred and fifty dollars a month for the service. And I said, this is the reality, but now we're down to, we get one complaint a month out of 120 units. And it's really minor stuff, not it's under control now, but it took about 10,000. And the reason I asked about the HUD is because we had to get a private grant to yeah. get the, the, get it done. And it took us three years, but I donated a hundred thousand dollars of it because 50,000 of the grant wasn't enough to cover this so i said you know hey it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in three years to accomplish what you were thinking you were doing with a twelve hundred dollar a year contract there's a big disconnect between the reality and what it really costs on all parts but putting the blame on the industry for something that you hired them to do at that money and then not say hey it's really our responsibility to do IPM when IPM isn't being practiced because there is no money in the budget to really practice IPM. Well, and you bring up the thing that when I talk about our school IPM rules, and even though the re rules require the district, meaning the superintendent must appoint an IPM coordinator, 
I circle back around and it's back in the rules. But the administrators have got to support that IPM program. Right. Sometimes that is in financial ways. Right. It's not just what are you putting out to solve our pest problem? It's that prevent preventive measures. Right. So yeah, do door sweeps or um, they make those green drains depending on where those are at. Yeah. Those all work, but convincing somebody, oh yeah, this is part of your pest control program. They're like, what? No, you just got to spray. Cause that's right. what the TV told me you do. Right. Actually, no, we're learning more. It's just, we don't have reality TV on what we really do for pest control. Right, which which I I am, we're launching. I'm gonna launch five. I got two. I've got our nature pest one, which we educate our customers on what we do and why we do it this way. We've got the Pest Geek Podcast, which I think this episode is like three ninety or something. Um, been doing it for six years, but we really do have to launch. You just gave me a brilliant idea as we were talking. Why don't? Why isn't there some type of cooperative effort? with really good SEO because it costs money uh, to do it. But why don't we have a, a, a YouTube channel, Ask a Master Gardener, where we interview master gardeners from all over the country on their areas and say- What an idea. And then we just have them on and we ask them about plants and problems in their specific area. And, and we include, which I'm fanatical about the the extension service, the cooperative extension service, where we, because most of the master gardeners I know down here come out of the extension service. Well, it's, it's extension sponsored. So the, yeah. that is a, a, a federal state supported program, master gardener, master naturalist that allows extension a way to teach others so that we can get our material out. And I'm always struggling and trust me through COVID, even those volunteers are struggling on what to do. And I love your idea. I mean, I, that, is, we, that if, is just genius. We, because I, I, I've been having, I had this conversation, we sat down to dinner, I had the conversation with Oi, and she says, why isn't IPM popular? She hit me with that question. I says, cause it isn't marketable. The problem is all of you've got the information but all of you have all these handcuffs of what you can say, where you can go, what you can do. You can't go on a YouTube channel like you and I, in most cases, a lot of people in the, in this inside. Um, even I'm trying to get Dr. Kohler on the, on the podcast. There's certain things they can't be on because of their rules. And, and, and the idea is if, if we can put it in print, but a homeowner isn't going to read, Yep. A document written by the extension service. This They want a solution that says, do this, do this, do this. Just like when I go to YouTube and I said, how do I change the alternator? There's five videos on how do I change for my specific model mm -hmm. that somebody's gone through it. And we have all this knowledge bottled up under a lampshade in the dark where nobody's looking for it. And this is why I do YouTube. This is why people laugh at me. I do TikTok. I said, I just got a thousand followers on TikTok uh, talking about bugs. Okay. It, 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 we have the technology. We have the knowledge. Why aren't we using it? A lot of it. And I'll, I'll speak to what we, we've been struggling here in Texas. It's that one final component. So it's getting things out, getting it. There's never enough hours in the day to do everything you want to do. Of course, yeah. And this is part of it. And yeah, part of it's part of it is also educating others that it's okay to think outside of a box. Yeah. You know, oh, well, we've only only oh, done, you know, garden fairs or whatever. Well, yeah, but y'all are master gardeners, you can do other things. Right. It's but it's again, I would, I would, I'm thinking of going right now. I'm going to talk to a bunch of nurseries and we want it. We're going to start a, the, um, it's called the nursery showcase where we bring on, this is, I'm looking at a five day a week podcast 
and and what we're going to be doing is showcasing one plant from a nursery where we talk about the 10 questions where do you plant it what sun does it need what pest does it get what disease you know where can you get it what usda climate zone can you plant it in and we answer all those basic questions on that one plant the nursery gets a free promotion where people can go get their plants locally if they want that plant we get to put out important content so that the customer doesn't put that plant in the wrong place doesn't select a plant they can't maintain yeah and 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 it's a five minute podcast literally these are five minute conversations about all of this and you showing the plan and this is how you do it and this is how you care for it and this is you know if you're going to put it in a pot you're going to have to put it in six months in this pot and then there and we have these 10 minute conversations about something they know which is their plant oh well, yeah and, because... and, and we could do something like this with the extension service which i i'm trying to get my extension agents to get on i'm having enough trouble getting them on facebook just to post a a two minute thing about something they wrote and say, look, guys, if you put it on Facebook and you put the link, people will read it. There, I don't have time. I said, how many times a day do you go to the bathroom? You can sit on the commode and do this. Literally. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, the excuses of why things can't. I mean, you're sitting. Yeah. I do it. I'm posting stuff while I'm using time management, uh, you know, and, and getting the information out because I think there is so much information you know, you, the, the stuff Faith Oi writes, I basically take it and I verbalize it to where it's communicable. I think that's the right word to people. Uh, I came up with my own words. That's uh, okay. So do I. Yeah, I, I used to have a boss that was from Texas and he used to come up with his own words too. And I thought it was hysterical. Um, but, you know, how do we how do we get the industry to work together with academia with extension which I'm, I'm a fan about which nobody wants to do by the way most I people and I, and, I, and, and i and i and i and i applaud the, uh, philip kohler because he's done that with the conferences he's put out and the magazine he bought and you know the, the university got involved and and he, he he made i think the right steps in the right direction i think we just need to take it further i'm just one of those guys that says hey look i might not agree with you 100 percent but you know can we value the differences and and have these conversations where we can educate people on this well i think you just hit on the nail on the head because the hardest part and we're having a conversation we're having in this country is to understand you can agree to disagree yeah and it's going to be okay yeah and yes we do need to work in more partnerships and i really wish that the industry, I mean, I can tell you right now in Texas, I wish they would reach out more right? and say, hey, we're here to help. How can we help? Right. Because, you know, we can reach out all the time, but I don't know what you're doing and how you're doing it, but everybody knows where I hang out. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm not that hard to track down. No, right. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think creating the content at scale is an overwhelming mind mind numbing task of how we're going to accomplish this but when you've done several hundred of these you kind of figure some things out that help people and it's not that hard like where are you going to come up with the content the content is in your head you know this well yeah because we're just believe it or not full disclosure my teammates and i are coming up with a um a podcast and part of it has to do with the fact of what we do get in common insect ID questions. Yeah. You know, we're going to just cover what we normally get here. I mean, our first podcast I, I, is going to yeah. be on fire ants. Yeah. And do it on video. Don't do it just on audio because there's so many people that aren't looking for audio. It, it's it, nobody is looking for a podcast on let me sit here and let me listen to information about bugs just for the heck of it they need a practical solution in order for them to find you. I mean, I was just pointing that out to California. They have an IPM website that has 250 subscribers. And this is in California where people are supposed to be environmentally yeah. crazy about this. And you've got 250 subscribers to a channel. I, I, I'm saying like I get 250 watches the moment I put it out. 
and they've this video now has been on for two years i think three years 250 views on it to where they don't get that you can't legislate this information it can't be about compliance it has to be about what interests the homeowner and that is i don't want any bugs in my home and it has to be practical how do i do it yeah and so we got to give the secrets away which is what everybody's upset with me about for the last six years they're eating their liver and what i'm doing is i'm getting pesky bottles of ketchup to hand out so that they can put it on their liver uh and, and eat it because there's nothing i can do to help unless i give it away for free well i mean because the the truth be told the one sitting on the data is the one you've you've had dinner with truth be told only a small per percentage of the american population purchases pest control right. it is a very small percentage yeah and this is Therefore, why companies the sell direct to consumer it themselves yeah and i would much rather have them have the right information than them going down to some big box store and listening to some sales guy or whatever make a decision because they don't understand yep and and my answer to that is if you have the knowledge and you have the expertise why aren't you putting it out and that's where i'm goading no the, and the, the, mean, the trust me we struggle because we put it yeah. out there and again it it's this isn't the hot sexy topic so we can't even get people to pick it up yeah well let me tell you something if you go to my nature pest channel I've got 200 videos. We're getting ready to produce five a day. And we've got over 5,000 subscribers. We have more subscribers than any pest control company in America right now. Because we, we make it sexy. But we have to give practical advice on how they actually solve it, where I put out my entire protocol on roach control, which is what Deanie Miller does. By the way, if you look at that, you'll laugh and say, this is what Deanie Miller wrote. And I put it out on a 20 minute video where I take them step by step, how to solve a roach problem in an apartment. It's got almost 200,000 views. But again, that's what people need because you yeah. don't want them going down there and just spraying. Yeah. And, and my goal is how do we partner? Cause I have to read the information. I mean, I can read, you know, that's one of the advantages of my public school, I guess that I can, <laughs> I, I don't need a PhD to read a PhD dissertation on, on a certain study and then translate that to something that's, you know, that's applicable to a homeowner where we took out 99.9% .9 of it and distilled it to something they can consume. And that's the challenge that it needs to be consumable, but you mm -hmm. gotta be on TikTok, You gotta be on Facebook. You gotta be on YouTube. It can't be, I have our own blog on our own page. No, and nobody's, no, nobody's no, gonna go to it. Well, obviously you found me through Facebook, but yep. I'm, I'm, I'm not everywhere. I've not signed up for TikTok, but I'm like, we, we might get there. The house might get there. The IPM house might get there. Janet might, you know, but, but no, that's where I've said all along is it's got to be in short blibbits of what they understand. It's the who, what, when, where, how, and why. Yep. And practical. This is, you know, if you're going to apply it, the problem is nobody wants to tell people to apply a pesticide and that's where the homeowner is going to say, but you told me, you told me what was wrong with my car. You just never told me how to fix it. If you yeah, don't tell no. me how to fix it, it's totally useless. And this we is have to, and I mean, yeah. and that's something I'm, I truly do believe in, not just myself, but the people I work with here in Texas extension is because, and it has a lot to do with the fact of, because we do have stringent licensing. Yep. We want to make sure, I mean, I don't care who you are. There is a pesticide. It's got a label. You yep. should be able to understand that label. Yep. And, you know, I was telling somebody, I said, you read the label when you buy food. Right. Why don't you read the label when you buy anything else? Right. It, I, it, it's, 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 it, because people, here's the, well, I was reading a study out of California. They did, did back, I think it was in 98. It was, it's a pretty old study already. Um, and where they asked homeowners why they waited so long to hire a pest control company. I know the study. 
And, and basically they said, well, because the stuff that pest control people use are so much more toxic than the over-the-counter stuff. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, Delta Methrin at 6% and Delta Methrin at 6%, it's exactly the, the same thing, but they think. And here's, here's what the industry did it to itself. Yep. Because they said, what we have is so much stronger, you can't get it. And now that is the unintended consequence of now complaining that do my own and places like that are selling it direct to consumer without a license. And I said, what well, is a general use pesticide? They never needed a license. And it was never that toxic as you claimed it was. And yes, now they can get it. And we unintended consequences of that is customers. Orkin has said for the last 50 years, it never goes above 20% nationally. People are misapplying pesticides because we refused to tell them the truth and give away all our secrets. And now we're in the age of transparency and you have a bunch of people that are just self-protective that, and that's where we're at. And I think that's where we need to start. The change needs to start. Well, I've always, I, it, it's funny because many of my arguments are, well, you know, if they do it, we're going to lose business or if we do this, we're going to, and I'm like, I'm sorry. As long as you, there's pests in the world, there will always be work for us because seasons change, dynamics change, thir certain things happen. Yeah. Heavens to Betsy, insects are one of our bigger indicators on other things that be, can be going on, yeah. especially inside a structure. You know, but it also, you know, the random, well, we've got this smell. I know it's something dead. Well, where's the flies? Well, we don't have flies. All right. You can't have dead without flies. Flies. They do go together. But if you're still having an, a strong odor, smells like death, and it's an exterior, I said, either look for a leak or watch for a different type of fly. So right. yes, yeah, sosids or something else can come because again, if it's a fungal and a bacteria right. growing, yes, they can grow from that. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I look, I just had this discussion with one of my techs at a job where we, when we do um, drain fly work, we always put a lamp. We're one of the, one of the few companies that put a lamp and we say, we install a lamp in the bathroom. We got a plug in lamp. And the tech said, well, I didn't put it because the customer said they didn't have a fly. They have never seen any flies. And I said, well, biology 101 says if there's a child, there's a parent somewhere. And sure enough, there was a problem with water behind the wall and we found it and we sucked it out. And the, every, I sat there for an hour with a vacuum cleaner and a, and a hair dryer getting the water out, which no chemical, he says he already had foamed it. The, that foam was not going to go into that wall because nope. it was waterlogged. And I said, he installed the lamp, come back a week later, we're, we're seeing flies now and that's no flies on the lamp. This is funny. I mean, this is the funny stuff we have to deal with for two weeks, three weeks. He didn't install the lamp because the customer said he never found, but we kept finding larvae he installs the lamp. I go in and there's no flies on the lamp. I said, something's wrong. I look in there and the paper backing wasn't removed from the glue board. Okay. So I, I, I tell him and he was flustered already with this situation because he's already been there four times and the customers was very patient. But I said, why did you listen to the customer to begin with? We don't listen to the customer. We're the experts. They are paying you you should have installed that lamp and at least we would have gotten the adults down from and stopped the breeding. I, I showed him cause he's a one year tech. I said, this isn't in any manual where you have to suck water out of a wall with a vacuum cleaner and out of a tile and then clean this out, carve it yeah. and caulk it. This isn't in any manual. It's on, not in malice. It's not in Purdue pest management. It's not in any IFAS site. You're not going to find it. So I sit there and, 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 and we finally, oh, guess what? I take the backing out. I'm doing the cleaning and I'm doing all that. And the customer comes and look, hey, there's a fly on the board. It wasn't five minutes later that they, it started catching flies. And 
after that, we left it there for another week. We came back and we looked again and there was a little bit of larvae. If caulk had separated, dried it out again, resealed it. No chemical was needed to solve that problem, except, well, the caulking, which is a chemical. I know I'm going to get probably eat it anyway. So, you know, yeah. And, and so, so, so that was, th these are the things, but we have technicians in the field that aren't trained. And this is one of those where I could have told him all about larvae and he still wouldn't have hit because he was still used to doing some type of chemical application instead of just saying, let me get a vacuum cleaner. And this is where the experience comes in, where I talk mm -hmm. to them unless we're putting this content out. So what I, what did I do? I carry a, I carry this. I carry two of these, by the way, sometimes I carry three. Bless your heart. <laughs> Every, everything I do in my mind is content. And I stood there and I have a little stand that I carry with me and a microphone that plugs into the side of this. And I just put it on the floor where I'm doing the work and I show them how I'm vacuuming this. And then I edit, I just barely do any editing and I post it on YouTube and then I'll post it on TikTok. And we spend about three and a half hours a day doing this. Every single day putting out content every single day because there's no excuse. It's like, you don't need a $10,000 camera anymore. It's oh no. You can stand at your desk. I mean, you and I have been having an hour plus conversation about really important stuff that people need to hear. And I said, if we can just get off of this, well, what if we say the wrong thing? And what if we tell the wrong thing? And I, I said, if you know your stuff, you know your stuff. And, no, and just um, tell your story. And I think if you tell your story yep. and you as a professional, just get out there, guys. Hey, this is what we're dealing with right there from your desk, not going to a studio. The lighting doesn't have to be perfect. I've done videos just to prove people wrong. That I've done videos with no muff on a microphone in 15 mile an hour winds and did a lawn. Uh, I did a piece on on. St. Augustine lawn care, how to mow it right, how to do this in full wind. And I've had three people complain, you should have used a wind muff. No kidding. But it's still got 150,000 views. Yeah. So we, we got excusitis for everything we can't do. When <laughs> if I got five minutes and I and I'm I can just sit in front of a camera, you know, this set behind me is 25 bucks, you know, wow. And you got a desk which trumps mine. Um, behind you and, and we, and, and you've got all this knowledge. And I said, put it guys, just start putting it out, figuring out. And you do, you've got to be, to be authentic to yourself. You've got to. And that's why I, you know, I tell everybody, I, I don't mind ruffling feathers. I've, I've come to do that. Yeah. Oh, I do a ton of it, but you know, at the same time, it, what I'm ruffling over isn't, I mean, it's not earth shattering, but it's, it's important. Yeah. It's highly important. I, I, I mean, I, I, having this discussion with a lot of people who are just, you know, and, and there, there, there's a three people that we, we find in this IPM can't be done. IPM needs to be redefined so that it can be done correctly, because if not, we can't call it IPM legally. And then nobody wants IPM and who the heck cares? Um, and that's the, the three. Yeah. And I say, I found the perfect harmony with that. I'm okay with not impressing you. I'm okay with not having everyone agree with me in the industry because I'm consumer centered. Why I called my company nature pest is because I found out that people were looking for natural and organic pest control and there was nobody providing it because nobody wants to say we're natural organic where IPM is an extension of organic and, but I can't say that because what is my competition going to think? What is my competitors are going to think? I don't care. I care what my customer thinks. Yeah. And, and what we're offering them is a zero spray solution inside to solve 99. The only time we have to do a surface spray is for fleas. That's it. We can solve silverfish, ants, roach, every single ant problem we have, we solve with bait. Every single silverfish problem, we reduce the humidity and use yep. borate baits. 
every single roach problem that we have, we solve with baits. We don't do crack and crevice. We don't even do crack and crevice applications. Only bait. And we solved it. And people say it can't be done. Well, it can't be done where I am. Well, what can you do? Can you just do the German roach part? Because I, as far as I understand, the only place I think where German roach biology is a little different is in Hawaii, where they actually can live outside. Well, okay. But in Hawaii, they don't have doors and windows either. Yeah. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? So unless something has radically changed, my protocol can be implemented and what, you know, Dean yeah. Miller put out it can be implemented anywhere. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And this is where people are losing it. And I said, what can you implement? Can you seal? Can you do the, yep. the, the training on the customers? Stop buying from that store that you're buying, that ethnic store, because this is where we mostly get it or the restaurant that they're buying from because they're bringing it in in the bags or stop buying the used furniture at garage sales so you don't get bugs in your yep. house. And once we solve that problem in a residential home, they should not have German roaches anymore. Nope. I uh, And it's the same thing with schools. I, I tell yep. everybody, my biggest thing is what, with schools, I can't fix what comes from the house to the schoolhouse. Right. So, you know, but it's education, education, education. And that's much tougher where you're at at school because, I mean, what do you do with a kid that nobody wants? I mean, nobody wants to say I have bed bugs. And, I mean, I had a situation where a school district, but we've learned. The nurse, the risk manager, the IPM coordinator, they all get together. All right, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Here's your information. Now, here's the part here's what you got to reach out to the family with yeah, and then go from there. But yeah, Dr. Merchant left us enough information on his city bugs website that, you know, I can still give them the DYI. Here's the right. things you need to know. Right. Because I mean, you can put stuff in, in large trash bags and put them outside in a hot sunny day, especially down there. Y'all get that sun just as much as we do. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the, I think our bigger problem is, is it's not my job. I don't care. Just kill it, make it dead, go away. Yep. That is the, that's an attitude that. And, and I think it's, but it's not just in, in pest control. If you look at nutrition. Oh, it's and, all of it. It's all of it. it it's, it's, it's just, rat, we want a pill. We want an instant. I mean, even now where we, we were COVID, we learned that, hey, we can order food and have it delivered for breakfast. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the instant gratification of everything in society is the problem yep. where we just want. And I said, look, I, I, even with like with contractors that I deal with, I said, guys, that paint is dead. That wood is dead. The concrete is dead. You can mold it. You can do whatever you want. Guess what? There's three things that are alive in this house. One of them is the owner, their pets, their, and their landscape. It's all alive. And the bugs and diseases that are on it are also alive. This is all biological. And you're dealing with all the human emotions. And you're dealing with the human. And everybody forgets we're dealing with humans. We're not dealing with things. So those are the challenges that I'm having is when I'm having the conversation, nine times out of ten, I'm having an emotional conversation. I'm having a rational one. Yeah. And, and I, and you, and, and technicians that are geared toward being technical, they're just as guilty as the doctor with the bad bedside manner, treating the patient's illness, not treating the patient. And we forget that it's a, this, we are in a people business. Yes, we are. We're not in a product business. We're not in well, a pesticide I mean, business. And sometimes it's the same with a plumber. It's the same with an electrician. Yeah. It's any they're clammy. <laughs> well, and I mean, if I want someone to come into my home, I don't want them glued to their phone. I want them to explain something to me and don't talk down to me. Right. I mean, that's just simple human behavior. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, you know, when I pay you and it doesn't matter, I'm paying, yes, I'm paying your company. But whoever is coming out to represent said company, that customer's paying you for that knowledge. 
Yeah. And it's okay to sit and explain to somebody five, 10 minutes, well, this is where this would come from. And this is why we do this. Right. So again, so that people understand where you're going. We, we sometimes tell folks only part of the story and we should probably tell them the whole story so that they get the picture. Right. Yeah. And, and people are afraid that if I tell them too much, then they're going to think it's too complicated or two, they're going to get somebody else or they're going to try to do it themselves. What I've experienced is the company that calls me when the customer picks up the phone, they've already done the fogging. They've done the baiting. They've done the tablets. They've done the dust. They've done the boric acid all over the house, the diatomaceous earth. They're at their wits end already when it's in a rental. When it's a expensive client, he's like, I make $250 an hour as a lawyer, $400 an hour. There's no way I'm doing this. Yeah. That's it. So either way, even if I, I tell people how to do, I use Rutgers protocols and I send it to my client who says, I can't afford you to do bed bugs. Here is a video from Rutgers on how you actually do it. And the next thing that comes, the call comes back and says, that is so complicated. I don't have the patience to do that. I don't know. My husband doesn't have the patience to do that on how to solve a bed bug problem. That's the reality. We're into this instant gratification. We want it solved and we want it cheap and we want it fast and we want it instant download. I says, you got to sleep on that mattress for two weeks while those bed bugs die. I can't guarantee you I got all of them. Mm -hmm. And, and we, and, but we have to there. I, I say 90% of my job is education. The 10% of solving that bug problem is easy. Yep. Once I let the customer, once they understand the data, like I had a customer just call me yesterday. I do a consult. I'm just, I guess it's my nature and nurture to be consultative and teach and educate people. Customer calls me yesterday on rodents and says, we, somebody left the door open and we got this rat in the house and we can't catch it and we can't kill it. I'm concerned because I've got two dogs and a cat. And the first thing that came to my mind is he's got food out for these guys. So I said, are you leaving the food out at night and water for them to drink? And he says, yes. And I said, I, the first thing for me to catch that rat for you, I need you to stop feeding those animals at night, pick up all the bowls, wash them and put them away and put the dog food away where the rats can't reach it. And then I hear a, okay, let me talk to my wife about, it. she's not going to want to do that because they want to feed the dogs all the time. I said, dogs don't need to eat at night. No. They don't need to drink water at night. It's much more difficult for me to convince his wife that if you want me to catch it, because where am I going to put the trap? And he's got dogs and kids. Where am I going to put rat traps inside that home to catch it? where somebody's not going to get their fingers diced off. I got to put it in a box. Am I going to get a rodent to go into that station while that food is just laying there for him to eat and drink? No, not unless you put it in the station. So I had to tell the customer, I says, unless you can do this, I can't solve your problem. And it's probably not going to happen in two to three days because that rat is looking for his food and he's not going to eat something else for a couple of days. I, it might take me two weeks to trap it in there. And if he found a way out or wherever, I mean, it, and it was, it was harder for him to tell his wife she couldn't feed the dogs at night. Uh huh. That's an emotional problem. That is not a biology problem. Yep. And that's what we're dealing with. And this is what most people who get into pest control don't understand. And people that are training them don't understand that we, we live in an age of experience. It's the customer. We're no longer about customer service when it was solving the problem after the fact. We're now into what is the experience with that cost company from the get go? Not whether they kill. I said every time I get a complaint from one of my technicians, it's not because he didn't kill the bug. It's because he left the gate open. It's because he used the hose. We do not get any complaints for bugs. These are all things that had nothing. I said, you see, every yep. time I tell you it had nothing, you, why are you rushing? Why aren't you taking the time? 
you know, the customer starts talking to them and then yapping and he's introverted and he doesn't know how to deal with a customer that follows them all over the house and talks yep. to him. I mean, these are all issues that we're not training for. And when, it's going to be part of the training process. No, yeah. we talk about that because I say, even when we do our school IPM training, we have a, a line in the rules that says something about pesticide complaints. And I always say that, you know, make sure that your pest control people understand that if somebody's following them around, they let you, the coordinator, know. Because for some reason, they're doing that. Now, granted, it could be just simple curiosity because that's my mom yep. or you know it's they're looking over your shoulder because they're afraid you're going to do something wrong but whatever it is it, you can engage them hey this is what i'm doing because once you start telling them what you're doing then they kind of like okay whatever gotta go bye yeah yeah once i once i once i get through my ipm course with that client he doesn't want to know any more about bugs. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. You're like, yeah, all right, you got it covered. See you later. Gotta go. Yep. And and it's and it's part right. about having a process every single time that you just repeat every single time with everybody. And some people are, you know, I I've got all kinds of people that don't want anything to know about what I'm doing. And I still have to tell them. You know, I put that monitor because I got cleaning ladies who will throw out my monitors. Yes. Oh, yes. You know, and they'll throw out my little stations and they found it on the counter. And they'll, what is this? They just throw out my, you know, and the lady of the, the lady of the house and the owner have no clue what the cleaning lady is doing. Um, so I got to communicate with everybody. Like I've got these monitors under these stove and underneath here. When she cleans, <laughs> leave it there. Do not throw it out. So it, it, it 90% of what we do is communication. The, the, Pest tough is like the super easy stuff. Yep. It, it is. I mean, it's what we do. It's kind of hard, but once you learn it, it's like, it's not that hard. Uh, 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 when you get, when you master the basics and, and that's where I focus on is getting people just to ma master the, 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 um, the, the, the basic principles. If you can master the, the basics, yep. you're going to be okay. Uh, not to get overwhelmed. So it's just, Ah, we got so much work to do that it, it does become overwhelming. So the way I figured is I just carry three phones with me and record everything I think. Uh, and, and I come across um, because well, we've got somebody like you out there doing that. Cause I keep saying we need the next generation to come up after us be, and they yeah. need to do it bigger and better and louder because. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to I encourage the next generation. Cause I, I am probably closer to your age than you think <laughs> where I think we're contemporaries. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I think we, we, and one of the things that I'm, uh, I've been taunting about talking forever, I figure I, I'm either going to shame you into action or goad you into action. I'm like a, like an electric cattle prod for most people. If you're in Texas, you know what that is. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, where, where I want, but I've been talking about, bringing this into the public schools where we're talking to students about IPM. And, oh, and, and, dude, and, and, I've wanted that one for a long time. And I'm like, yeah, well, that one's like the Don Quixote. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I'm, I'm talking about that because I, but I'm talking to, the problem is I'm talking to, I'm, I'm, I, I do training for the County. I teach at the extension service. I deal with the agents and I'm like, why can't we get, you get, you got a 4-H program and you work for the same county and we can't somehow get this into the public school that you work for i'm trying to scratch my head on that one but <laughs> yeah i can tell you my my backstory and it has to do all with the education system right yeah i mean it just I, oh i come up with these ideas and then i'm like uh, yeah. Right. Three more of me. Yeah. And a lot of volunteers, maybe we could get something, but I'm thoroughly convinced that's if recycling is where it got started and water conservation got started when we were kids in school, 
where do you think this all needs to start? Yeah. Where do where are kids hanging out today, by the way? Probably in front of their computer screens. Yep, that's where we need to be. Yeah. When when, when kids are on TikTok, people are like, "You're going to create videos for kids?" I said, "Yeah," because they're going to tell their parents and they're going to tell their grandparents. Yep. It's it's a, if you really want to influence, you got to be where they are and you got to get over the oh that's for kids because now you can learn anything on anything. Oh well, yeah. So if I want to, if I want to influence, I got to be where people are. are. They are they on Twitter? I would be on Twitter. If they're on LinkedIn, I'll be on LinkedIn. If they're on Facebook, if they're on YouTube, I don't care. I I, 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 I you got to get past yourself, I guess. And then this well, yeah, is, and I mean that that's it. I mean that's why I'm I'm talking about all this because I said you know if I can influence a couple hundred people, I don't need a thousand. I just say one. I'm yeah. always happy if I can get one to convert. Yep. And, 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 and not only that, but if we can influence somebody, a hundred people that can influence, yep. we got plenty of bra brains. I mean, I'm, I've, I've seen every three of the videos that Bobby Corrigan has out publicly. I like to see 500 of them out. I like to see Dini Miller stuff out. I'm trying to get her on the show. So if you talk to her, um, I already, I already reached out to her. She told me she would. I just think I need to prod her a little bit more. Yeah. You gotta just, <laughs> gig her on facebook yep 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 she follows me she knows what, what i think um yeah. I, I love the stuff she puts out i mean i'm a big fan uh, i'm a big fan of all the university people because they they've done the research they've done the work the problem is nobody's reading it and i think to me like it's sitting in a library nobody's going to read and that's why i like to see it out there and that's where we we struggle is getting those messages out i tell everybody even when I'm talking to new new professionals in extension, yeah, you've got this document and what extension is supposed to do is translate from the teaching and the research and get it outreach, but the message may be the same, but you carve it differently for a different audience. Yeah. And and we got to get used to the new media that everything is audio visual. It's nobody's yeah. reading people. I get people who are having a fit that nobody's reading their books. And I said, whose fault is that? I said, you, you're blaming people for not, you know, it's like, it's the, like the buggy whip guy complaining that nobody wants to buy buggy whips anymore. I said, why don't you just take it and take your videos and illustrate them in a way that's visual and audio. That's why I listen. That's why I have 250 audiobooks because I don't read. I listen. Now I read technical material. I just, I, I'm funny because I can't read entertainment material. It bores me to death to read a book, a business book. I, I, I am, I like going to conferences and lectures, so I will listen. I'm audible, but I'm also visual when it comes to the technical stuff. I can devour 200 page D, PhD dissertations, like nothing because I, I like going to technical material. So for a guy like me, you're going to have to give it to me all three ways if you really want to engage me yep because that's how i'm engaged and we need to learn to engage people where they're at um and i think that is probably the next conversation but education understands this and yet they don't do it because we know how kids learn they, some are kinesthetics and some are visual and some are you know and we understand how well kids then learn. what happens is is then you get like in my situation you get bogged down with an agency that's going in, in multiple directions. And then you can't always get into yeah. the lane that you need to be. Yeah. Yep. And, 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 and I get it. it it's, it's tough. I mean, I, I know, I mean, I have got, I can't do any more hours. I can't put any more time. I can't do this. And I said, okay, um, fig, let's figure out a way that we can get together and do it. Um, that's why I'm doing the channel. That's what, that's why I keep doing this after six years. Like people, why do you do this podcast? Um, it drives hey, me well, because, listening. You keep doing it. Yeah. And, and you have to stick to it and it isn't going to happen. I got guys that quit after three, after a dozen podcasts I said, guys, you, you want to cause a movement. You're, you're going to have to do it for the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. And, 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 be, and be at it to cause a movement. I, I think, I think the movement is happening in the marketplace. 
where people are not wanting the pesticides. They're more educated. They're not wanting it. The manufacturers don't want to hear that because we have to sell less. This is why there's a lot of reconciliation in the industry. I get it. Um, but the reality is people want natural, people want organic, people want less. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we got to figure out how we're going to give it to them. Um, uh, you know, that's where, that's where the challenge is because nobody wants to work themselves out of work. You know, this is why we've got all of a sudden the sale of Bayer happening of their pest control division. Why Sygenta sold, why all of the pest control companies are merging. Yeah. It's a, it's a whole thing. A whole shift is happening in the industry. A lot of people just don't want to change because they're the baseboard jockey and they don't want to hear it. Well, and change is always, it's painful. doesn't matter what it is. Change can be scary for a lot of people. Yeah. The truth of reality is change happens no matter what. You cannot yep, yep. live through life without changing. Yep. And the more you fight it, the harder it is. So it's easier just to, to give over and then figure out how do I move forward? Right. And with this, with the pest control stuff, there's lots of ways to move forward and not have to spray something that could potentially harm a human, yourself, right. the environment, or a non-target. Right. Yeah, and, and, most pe and most people really care about when I, you know, I, I started with this passion for protecting pollinators and protecting, and then I realized none of my customers cared about that. What my customer cared about is, number one, is it going to affect Fifi? I literally get asked. I had a guy yesterday ask me, well, the reason I ask about how the pesticides are you using are safe is because I have a dog. And then I hear this little baby in the background. Nye, 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 nye. He didn't ask me about the baby. He asked me about the dog. And I've said this at conferences, more people are more concerned about their pets than they're concerned about their children. It's the weirdest thing in the world that, you know, the little baby's running around the floor where the pesticide's gonna be, but you're more concerned about the dog. And I found out that that's where I needed to target because people didn't care about the poly. If, if I can do it for the same price yep. and be a benefit to protect the pollinators, that's wonderful. I just couldn't sell it. My idea of let's protect pollinators and let's protect the environment and let's protect the soil and the water because people are caring about what's in their home. Yep. Let me protect your, your home, your family and your pets. Yep. That's it. And that's what we had to focus on and be realistic. But we still, it's kind of like the way I look at it is when my child is little, I got to figure out how to get those veggies in there. Yep. I got to get the veggies in there. I got to be smart enough to know how to get it in. I don't care how the veggies get in. There's, they got to get in somewhere. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Yep. I, I, I don't understand that because I don't know why anybody would skin a cat, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've wondered about that as well, but guess what? You know, there's always, it reminds me of that, that, game you play when you're little we're going on a lion hunt can't get through it got to go under it got to go around it yeah. there's always a way right. where there's a will there's a way and you can do it you just cannot let can't get in your way yeah throw that word out yeah and then understand that pest management really is more about being a good pest detective yeah and you sell those services yep no i i i, I am totally sold on that concept i you know, my consciousness as, as a business owner of having a conscience of what is the right thing to do and then realizing that the challenge of doing it is high, the cost is high, I had to come to terms of who my client is and, and realize that not everyone wants what I'm selling when you're wanting a cheap spray service, I can't help you because I can't reduce my technician to that. This is not what we do. It's actually against our policy. I will fire my technician for spraying the inside of a house, literally, uh, because that's against our policy is we make a brand promise to the client that we're gonna protect that indoor air quality, the surfaces, do everything that we can not to contaminate the inside of that home, or at least if we're gonna do it with a bait, it's still gonna be there but it's a whole lot less than having a liquid application. Mm -hmm. 
and and that is the promise we make that is what they're trusting us with they're trusting us with their health and some people will say well there's nothing wrong with it because all these products are safe if applied according to label directions the problem is i can't find that anywhere on the epa website okay so here's and this is an interesting debate and mm, so because epa registers a product and they approve the label the safety data sheet is by another agency occupational occupational safety and hazard or association osha you really want to know what's in your product you get the manufacturing safety data sheet that goes with whatever and you go look at section 11 it's called the toxic toxicology section that tells you exactly and it also tells you in a safety data sheet which you can't find on a label what are the inert ingredients right well if the inert ingredients are a petroleum distillate some petroleum product we learned a long time ago that petroleum is carcinogenic so yes the active ingredient may not be but if you put it together with this and mix it and make it thus, yes. But this is where, again, oh, well, that was just those organophosphates. Well, what were pyrethroids? Yes, they are the synthetic version of the pyrethrins, but they're also a man-made product. And then when you go and you look at the toxicology of it, the bifenthrin being one of them, you start looking at some numbers and you're like, huh, now I spray this product on the exterior perimeter. I roll my sleeves up. I don't wear gloves. And I do that at least five times a day, five days a week. But I don't share that information with anybody. And my employer doesn't really hammer home the fact about a safety data sheet. I just had, that, I just had that conversation online and, 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 and I, when I put stuff out there, I'm usually pretty intentional about, and, and, and I had the whole debate and I'll let you go back to your, to your thought on that, because everybody tells me that the safety data sheet is only for when there's an accident for a spill that you don't need it. And, and I just, and then I, I'm going, I'm going to go even further than that, but I'm going to go ahead and let you finish your thought on that. Go ahead. Well, and because you just brought up, mm, again, a common misperception. Yep. The time to read the safety data sheet is not when you have spilt it on your body and you're supposed to be going, well, now what do I do with all this? Right. No, it is no different, but I can tell you again, we don't do it. I buy a product off the shelf. I go and I buy brand x tylenol do i read the label no it's just tylenol i know what tylenol does i just need to know how many i need to take you know it doesn't matter i can do this and yet i'm a pest management professional and this is where i get frustrated most of the products are considered general use they're a general use household product therefore i don't have to do extra training or therefore under worker protection in the ag world, the only products I really need to train over are restricted use stuff. Bull hockey. I, I, I call, call everybody's bluff. No, since the eighties, we have had this right to know act and hazard communication act. And it has been around since I remember having to learn about liquid paper. Right. I remember the original trainings on that and the horrible videos we used to watch. But everything, including hand sanitizer, disinfecting wipes, all of those registered pesticides come with a safety data sheet. And you should know both documents. And if you're training your employees in pest management, yeah. by golly, by jeebers, they need to know a label and a safety data sheet. And, and here is my, here's what, here's my argument. I said, when I read a label, when I read a label, it says 
it is a violation of federal law to use this product inconsistent with its labeling. It does not say label. Yes, labeling, and labeling is different than a label. But it says, the law says that I have to use it consistent with the labeling, not with the label. And most people say, well, no, that's the label. And I, when you look at the EP website, that's not so. Yep. As a professional, you're supposed to read both. Yep. In order to comply, says, well, there's no compliance for an application on the SDS. And I say, well, I've proven many SDSs that actually require you to wear a NIOSH respirator when the label doesn't. You know, um, it, and COVID really kind of brought it up. Safety first. Prior to COVID, me talking to folks about a face mask, blah, 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 blah. People are now associating, wait a second, because I tell everybody, if you can smell it, FYI, you're breathing it in. So if you're spraying something, I don't care what it is, it can aerosolize and you don't know your body. We know a lot of things, but we still do not have a litmus test that I can go spit in a cup, you dip something in and it comes out and you stick it in something else and it says, Oh, well, these are all the things you're going to have a problem with within your life. Right. We don't have that. Therefore, what we have learned, because asbestos, I always use asbestos a lot in my trainings. When my grandparents were growing up and when they were building houses back then, and this went up until almost the 50s and 60s, you could touch asbestos and you could be dressed like we are, short sleeve shirt, you know, pants shoes with some socks, right? You go touch some asbestos now. And if you don't look like the Mitchell and man, you know, you can't go anywhere near it because what did we learn? Oh, even though we couldn't really smell it and we really couldn't see it, those asbestos fibers do transmit enough to where they go in and get deposited in our lungs. And oh yeah, some people get mesothelioma. Yeah. Not everybody, right? but you, I mean, who's going to take the crap roll of the dice of your, their lives and go, well, I'm not going to wear that personal protective equipment because I'm t- the tall and bulletproof. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the whole idea, we went from things that smelled to things that didn't smell and therefore they're safer because they don't smell. And the, the false impression of what, you know, the customer, what the customer doesn't see and doesn't know uh, doesn't understand. And even what the technician doesn't see, doesn't know and doesn't understand because I can see the need for SDS training where it's mandatory, where I still will have this argument where people says, have you read the SDS? Well, no, because I only need to carry it in case I have a spill. That's the general, that's the, if I, if I post that on Facebook, I will get 50% of the technicians in the country to say that to me. And I will say, well, that's why I did a video and I said, I proved to them by the EPA website that by law, they need to read and understand the SDS and people will like, because you have a solo operator that feels he doesn't have to, because he doesn't have employees. So, so that's well, fine. If you, if you want to take that risk. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Until somebody takes you to court. Yeah. And then, or you harm yourself and you don't follow the instructions, <clears throat> not every court's going to side with you because <clears throat> there is rules. Directions say, I mean, I go through directions. We do pesticide safety as part of our school IPM training. <clears throat> of course, I work with a pesticide safety education coordinator by the name of Dr. Don Ranchi, who will scare anybody to death because He's like, this isn't a joke. This isn't a game. You are playing with chemicals. You know, think about yourself first. And because he is a gentleman, he can go into some things, but he does make everybody look people. What are these hands? Put your hands in front of you. Look at them. Say to yourself, 
these are the nastiest things on my body. You know, you're doing things with this and you touch and, and we've learned what now we don't shake hands anymore. Right. right. Yeah. PP I'm glad that PPE became a household name. Yeah. So am I, I mean, in, in germs, I'm real happy about that because, you know, I've enjoyed not having cold and flu, Yeah. but at the same time, our industry needs to understand plumbers, electricians, railroad operators, you name it. If medical professionals, they all get extra training and it's so that we can be better at what we do. And if you don't strive to be the best that you can be, why? Why not? Right. Because you can. Yeah. No, I, 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 give I, it, I, I give it my best. It's just some days are better than others. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, I, I have. I mean, one of the things that burns me up as a professional, I've been in this now 14 years, and I've taken just about any class that's been available to me, paid um, to take. Uh, online, in person, it doesn't matter. I've never been in a CEU where they taught core, where they taught the label, and they taught the SDS. And all of them have been taught by a manufacturer's rep who glossed over and says, well, you just need to have it here. You need to carry it with you. But nobody's ever gotten into the... We go into the label and we get into what those 10 parts of the label that we have to know, and that's been taught to death. And then we talk about where this is how you would apply this product in this situation. This is where I've had the beef where industry training, where people are having this argument about the SDS when we have all the information available because it's glossed over and it's made to be sound like it's not important at all, really. So if I told you I was doing a webinar on April the 8th, on that specific topic, why it's important to understand pesticide labels and safety data sheets. You're telling me I, I'm, I'm, I'm going down the right road? I think you are. I think we're gonna poke a lot of bears. Well, that's what I was, I'm being asked by the National Pesticide Safety Education Center to help them do this because, and this really started the boat, the bear poking, I mean, beforehand, yeah. But with COVID, not only am I poking a bear, I'm stirring the pot because, again, kiddos not shouldn't be using um, wipes to to wipe down deaths. What part of keep out of reach of children? Right. Didn't don't you ever... understand? I mean, we've got products out there that I know last year when we were doing this and schools were reopening, watching a lot of my school folks looking at. <laughs> Yeah, they looked at the label and then they went and opened the safety data sheet and they were like, oh, they will give you nightmares. I mean, and that's when, you know, the conversation and me just kept bringing it up because we do have this national school IBM work group that I belong to. And this was one of those topics. And sometimes when you when you scream the loudest, they just come back at you and say, fine. Guess what you're going to get to cover? All yeah. right, I'll take on labels. And right. <laughs> I know it's not sexy, but I've yeah. got, I cover this because it's important. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I am even, even looking at what we do because we've stuck with, like I said, for we, we, I don't like the whole spraying thing. And even with products that we're using that are 25B products, they're exempt that don't have that quote on the label that says it's a violation of federal law to use this product because then you look at the sds and you're like this is why i've always refused to apply 25b products indoors well yeah i mean there again there are two pieces of paper so to speak gives you two two differing things of information but it's you who make the informed decision using that judicious part of that pesticide to figure out what is it. I mean, if you look at boric acid, yeah, it could be pretty scary, but I'm not going to aerial dust it. Right. I'm going to put it either. Like most customers do. 
you know, when they, when they toss it all over their kitchen, kitchen, but or, or, or diatomaceous earth because it's organic and they can dust it all over their house. I literally had one guy do that. He dusted his entire carpet and then decided he's going to vacuum it and, and forgot that there was no bag in the vacuum. Oh. And, he, and, and I walk into that and it looked like nobody had dusted the house cleaning for like six years as you realize you're breathing all this in. And he says, yeah, I know. I says, you need to hire a company to come in and clean this. I put on a respirator when I went in there to do a flea job because he had put the E O. He had exceeded the limit, the label limit. Not only that, but then when he turned on the vacuum cleaner, he created a dust bowl inside the house that circulated it everywhere. So, and then when we start talking about how pesticides attach themselves to dust, pyrethroids attach themselves to dust and people are have sealed homes and all of this stuff i mean i i got footage of stuff that i've seen that would make most people cringe um and and here being in miami i the whole hispanic culture of going because you still you know you're probably familiar with it because of your taxes where you go into a home and you use a thermal fogger in a home and it's perfectly okay uh in central and south america most people would cringe at seeing that but this is a normal occurrence for them um in, in undeveloped countries to just fog everything and yeah what's, what's the problem and, and and on top of that you're using petroleum distillates when yep. you're using thermal foggers um and and we could just and and what so when i'm talking to my clients who are you know we're 65 percent hispanic down here they're not getting this. It's not registering how, why we don't do this. Why we don't, I need you to come and fumigate. Why we don't spray. Why we protect the indoor air quality. Why we don't want their kids paws all over this or their dog's paws. Um, you know, and, but they don't read what I read. And then people say, well, that's just put out by university because they've got an agenda. I get it. Um, that's just the general distrust yep. of, of everything where nobody trusts the government, nobody trusts the educators, nobody trusts the company. And we got such an issue of distrust because there is no real transparency because it's not convenient most of the time to be transparent. No, I, we need influencers. Yep. And I, and I think this is where this is vital that I just need a hundred of you to come on and talk about this, uh, the real science behind what we do um, and, and how we get it done. And it can be done. It can be done as safely as possible. Uh, it can be done totally different than our grandparents understood oh, it. Most and, definitely. And 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 we don't have to keep going down that road. It can you can making minor changes. And I'm glad that people are listening to me. Technicians are saying, "Yeah, you know, my company told me to go fog a car with this product, and then I read the label and I said, thank God I didn't do it because I would have violated the law.'" That's the sad part is you got the owners yeah. and managers telling you who know less about pest control than you do. Um, so these are these are the things we got to work on, Janet. We got so much to talk about and so little time. <laughs> 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 but um, no, I really, I really do appreciate you being on and sharing and and having this conversation. Um, what do you want to leave the people with that uh, they should know and we can close it there? that you can achieve success. No, it doesn't happen overnight. The, so the old saying is Rome wasn't conquered in a day, neither will pest control. Right. Be patient, be thorough, be positive. Thank you. And have a good day. And, and, and have a pastacular day. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, um, how can they reach you or know more um, about you? Like I said, I'm, I'm very easy to find on Google, but you can reach me out at, um, let's see, my easiest one probably, well, Janet Hurley on Twitter. I'm Janet D. Hurley on Twitter. Um, the work address is ja Hurley at tamu.edu. That's the email. And like I said, you can find me everywhere. IPM Experience House, School IPM in Texas. Just Janet, just Google Janet Hurley, Texas. And You're I'm told you. by my own family, I pop up. 
<laughs> great deal. It's been great having you on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, Frank. All right, ma'am. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.